Hello, everybody. Um, so I'll be talking somewhat about the guide to um, SB 1383, but um, mostly about you know how we can close the loop locally with decentralized composting. So my name is Naomi Wentworth. I'm the founder of the Compost Group. Um, so kind of like what Bob mentioned, uh, there's a lot of challenges in managing our regional organics facilities or even getting them up and running. And I know I'm preaching to the choir with this information, but um, I mean, we all know there's zoning and permitting issues, there's nimbyism issues, all kind of pushing our organics recycling facilities, um, you know, far away from any population centers, which can increase the greenhouse gases and the costs associated with transporting the material such far distances. Um, there's, you know, those costs create uh, issues around creating the affordable options for, you know, our lower volume generators, like our smaller restaurants and small businesses. There's general confusion around, um, you know, what can, what should we be source separating? Um, you know, what is organic waste and what isn't? And of course, you know, when we are composting on, you know, a really big regional scale, um, can we actually ensure the highest quality compost? So, us, the team at the compost group, we kind of just wanted to look at all these issues and think, is there a different model that we can create that mitigates some of these issues or most of these issues? Taking initially kind of the theoretical approach, um, Calvary Cycle does have a permit exemption. Um, if you have a composting facility under 750 square feet and you don't keep uh, more than 100 cubic yards of material on site at any given time, you essentially just need to notify the LEA and allow them to come inspect your facility at any point to make sure you're using best management practices, but you don't actually have to go through the full um, multiple year permitting process. So you can get kind of get up and running pretty quickly. The biggest complaints with, you know, kind of the nimbyism uh, issue is odors, dust um, from, you know, our turners, uh, noise from all the trucks, um, those are kind of the biggest complaints. So, you know, can we mitigate odors and kind of use less equipment than other composting facilities? Um, can we kind of make a viable business model that keeps things affordable and close to our customers so it doesn't hurt our small businesses? You know, making really qu high quality compost means that we're kind of um, at the whim of the microbes. We have to feed them, give them water, give them air, otherwise, um, they, you know, don't want to uh, compost our material. So that that can be a pretty hard thing to do, you know, at scale with a, a varying feedstock and, um, um, you know, varying inputs every day. Um, and finally, you know, if we're processing in vessel, we can potentially increase the types of organics we can process to reduce that you know, confusion about are we taking meats out? Are we not? Are lemon peels okay? All of those questions that I'm sure all of your all of um, you know, our businesses are confused on right now. Um, so two years ago, we opened up a case study at Cal State San Marcos. Um, we got a, a little gravel lot to the side of one of their parking lots, um, and opened up a, you know, eight foot by 16 foot in vessel composting unit are um, to kind of work in those permit exemptions. We had, you know, some research questions going into this, like how much can we actually compost on a permit exempt footprint? And um, can we compost, you know, meats and bones and citrus and all those things that um, would create those odor and NIMBY issues um, if it were an open windrow? does composting in this way, this decentralized approach, um, but smaller scale, does it actually make financial financial sense? Um, and can we pass that cost savings onto our ratepayers? And then finally, is this a viable business model? Can we create enough high quality compost um, to sell to actually make this work as a business? It, it is a tricky business. Our two-year case study um, in the last year. I mean, things were pretty tricky in COVID without actually getting our numbers up. But in the last year, we um, diverted a quarter million of a quarter million pounds of food waste on our tiny little footprint. 
Um, we're able to accept, you know, any food scraps uh, to make it really easy on our customers. So we just tell them if it's from the earth in some way, you can throw it in the bin. Um, so that includes the meat, bones, paper, whatever. Um, we have found that we can make it fairly cost effective if we are able to sell our compost and we can pass that savings on to our small business customers. Utilizing that permit exemption, we are we do have a quicker startup time. Um, but the question of the day with community composters is, is it actually legal to be doing what we're doing? Um, and, you know, it, it's it's an interesting industry right now. It is, you know, we do have cow recycle on our side to say, yeah, it is legal to have this um, facility to actually do the composting um, in, in this way and following their best management practices and whatnot. Um, but I mean, it varies depending on jurisdiction if we're allowed to accept the feedstock, um, you know, just due to, you know, ex exclusive franchise hauling agreements with um, the larger scale haulers. So I do firmly believe that we need all hands on deck for this, you know, organics recycling uh, issue. Like here she said, we have 550 thousand tons of organic waste um, just in San Diego County. Um, so, you know, our, our big haulers are doing a really good job in knocking that number down quite a bit. Um, but, you know, there's plenty of organics to go around. <laughs> you know, we need all options for other reasons too. These organics really are a resource. Um, you know, our sloppier food waste, is really good for creating methane. If it comes in with a lot, a lot of water, it's gonna to wanna to go anaerobic really quickly. Um, so that's gonna create, you know, more methane for, um, you know, our anaerobic digesters. And if we have, you know, like a bakery customer who has a lot of carbohydrate rich food waste, that's a really good material for making um, bioplastics. If we have, you know, the fresher veg vegetative food waste, paper, meats, that sort of thing. That's really good for making soil amendments. So um, we definitely don't need a, you know, you know, single option for all of these half a million tons of food waste, um, but we can really see it as a resource and, you know, all work together to cut that down to zero tons. So that's all I have. Um, happy to take questions after uh, the next presenter. Uh, but if you have any other questions, feel free to shoot me an email.